Your eyes and your feet don't know anything about each other, but they work together perfectly as part of a complex system. And turns out you can build a software system that works the same way. I have worked on such a system and in this video I'll show you how to design a highly decoupled software system along with the pros and cons. This video is part of a 10 episode series on microservices communication, but all the ideas here can be applied to solve general decoupling problems. Let's take a video service that needs to generate a transcript for its audio. To do this, it calls a separate transcript service through a REST API. But for this to work, the video service needs to know a lot about the transcript service. It has to know what it is, how to contact it and what it can do. This dependency is called coupling and coupling can lead to problems. Think of two salsa dancers. They need to know each other's move and stay in sync. If one of them makes a mistake, it will affect the other. If the transcript service goes down, the video service must handle that failure and it might need to retry the request or have some special error handling logic for this. More coupling means more dependencies between services and this also creates more dependencies between teams. When the team responsible for the transcript service wants to make some changes, they have to coordinate with the video service team to avoid breaking anything. In a tightly coupled system, even small changes require extra coordination and this slows down progress and makes the system harder to maintain and manage over time. But fortunately, there is a way to reduce coupling. But to understand how to decouple our systems, we need to first understand why we have a natural tendency to build coupled systems. Because as developers, most of us are used to thinking in terms of procedures. You call a function with arguments, get a result, and make decisions based on the results. This kind of logic reads like a recipe, do this, then do that, then call this function, if it returns x, do y, and this style of programming is called imperative programming. But this way of reasoning about programs means that there is always some level of coupling. You need to know which function to call, what each function does, and what type of output to expect. Plus, it mostly allows for a one-to-one -one flow of information. This means that each step relies on the previous step. But there is another way of doing things which flip things around a little bit. Here is how it looks like. If event A happens, do this, and if event B happens, do that. This style of programming is called reactive programming. And in this style of programming, you don't call functions, you subscribe to events. You don't know when the event will happen, you don't know if the event will happen, you don't know if it will happen once or multiple times, you just subscribe to the event and you do something when the event happens. Let's go back to our video service example and apply the reactive idea. So instead of the video service sending a request to the transcript service, the video service could publish an event to a channel when a new video has been uploaded. Then the transcript service would subscribe to that channel and react when a new video event appears. But here is where it gets even more interesting. So imagine that we have a notification service that sends email when a new video is uploaded. Now the notification service can also subscribe to that same channel and react to the same event. These types of channels that allow for multiple subscribers are sometimes called topics. And this style of communication is called publish subscribe or PubSub for short. In this style of communication, the video service doesn't need to know where the transcript or the notification service are, how to reach them and what they can do. As a matter of fact, the video service doesn't even need to know that the transcript and the notification service exist. And for the team in charge of the video service, things are much simpler. All they need to worry about is when a video is uploaded, publish an event, and the rest is handled by the event consumers. This sounds ideal, but there are a few challenges to consider with this style of communication. So let's say our video service publishes an event with only the video ID and the video title. The transcript service can know that a video has been uploaded, but it needs the audio to start working. So it needs to send a request to the video service to get the audio. And the same for the notification service. It might need to know who uploaded the video to send an email to the right person. If the event only has minimal information, consumers still need to reach back to the video service for details, reintroducing some coupling. But how do you know what to put in an event if you don't know what the event is going to be used for? The answer is usually somewhere in the middle. From the video service perspective, you might want to put any generic information that you think could be useful for any potential consumer. You can think of the event schema as an API schema. Of course, it's not an exact science and it's okay to talk to the teams that are going to consume your event 
to see what they need. There is always going to be some level of dependencies, but this is often far less than with other styles of communication. Implementing pub-sub communication can simplify some things, but complicate others. Systems like this can be harder to reason about, especially if you are new to reactive programming concepts. Tracing information flow can also be harder, since you no longer have that clear step-by-step -step imperative structure. And there are three common issues you could run into when your services communicate via messages. So you can watch this next video to see what those are and how to get around them.